Hello my friend and welcome to part three of the how to make a music video series. This is kind of the final part in the whole series. There will be one final one though, which is a Q&A. So if you didn't get your questions answered in part one, which was pre-production or part two, which was production or in this post-production, then please ask your questions, go to the other videos, ask questions. We haven't decided when we'll record that yet, but we have some things we want to include in a final episode. So we wanna make sure we answer all the questions out there. Also go follow my friend Blaze. He's the one who really made this video and I was just helping him. He did an incredible job. He's based here in Kansas City, but he'll work for you anywhere and he is awesome. So definitely check him out. And then also check out Familiar to the Band because they are on Musicbed, they're on Spotify. Uh, so if you want to license their music for your videos, you can do that. If you just want to listen to it, you can do that too. So anyway, go check them out. And lastly, thank you so much for watching my channel. Um, hopefully you have liked and subscribed if you're interested. Um, otherwise, that's fine. But I just want to say thank you so much. It really means a lot to me, especially as I try and maybe add some new things to my channel or explore some other interests like film photography. So. If you're interested in film photography, stick around because I've got a video coming for you very soon. But otherwise, seriously, thank you so much for doing all the YouTube things and supporting my channel. It means a lot. Enjoy the rest of this video. I'll stop talking now. Well, in order to save time on what could be the very longest video that we run through, we are going to keep this somewhat quick and address just a few clips because what we will show in these few clips could be expounded uh, for a long time and we could look at every single clip in the sequence. So we're gonna try and keep this one really short if possible, uh, but we're gonna open up with the color and the profile settings that we used on the Fuji X-T3 to shoot because we'll dive straight into the color grade first. And uh, we used classic chrome at 200 megabits per second, right? Mm -hmm and um, a little bit of tweaking on that classic Chrome. Mm -hmm. Was it the profile that mm -hmm. I just normally use? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I actually have a video about this. I intend on making more videos about it, but you get great dynamic range, um, shooting in 10-bit, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, we weren't externally recording, we weren't using editable codecs like ProRes. Mm -hmm. It was just straight up H.265, 10-bit, 200 megabits per second, classic Chrome, uh, with a few tweaks. So I will link that video. Uh, there's really not much more to cover there. I guess you could speak briefly to why that, as mm -hmm. opposed to F-Log. Yeah, I feel like that profile just makes it really easy to turn around a video quickly. I think um, I knew that I was wanting to get this video out and just the process of converting F-Log and exposing F-Log the day of I felt like was going to be a little too much of a hassle and I've had really great luck um, using the classic Chrome profile and seeing, seeing side by sides. It, it seems like F-Log maybe in some circumstances gives you noticeable dynamic range but it seems really minimal and yep. um, I've had great luck with the classic chrome kind of tweaked recipe and it feels yep. like it works really yeah well. so that's that's it for the the color profile settings fuji the file stuff um it was long gop of course not all intra mm -hmm. uh, i will be putting out a video at some point about f log versus classic chrome uh, or my recipe of classic chrome because like blaze said in most scenarios most cases you will see minimal difference. Uh, so that'll be a different video for a different time, but let's go ahead and dive into the color grade. Uh, we're gonna cover color grade, the whip transitions, the zooms, and the TV mask and titles. So we're gonna try and get through this as quickly as possible and just hit like one or two clips maybe per mm -hmm. topic. So we're gonna dive in with the color grade first. So here we are in your color tab, and it is looking complex with mm -hmm. this node structure. Mm -hmm. A little intimidating maybe, yeah. even, even for me, I 
you know, I, I consider myself a, a one node wonder. Yeah. That's kind of my goal uh-huh. is to keep my node tree as simple as possible. Uh-huh. But walk me through start to finish. Uh-huh. Um, I know you already told me this, so I'll tell everybody. You uh-huh. started with the chorus because that was kind of the money shot. That was kind uh-huh. of like the main focus of the film. Uh-huh. It was definitely one of the most important sequences. Uh-huh. So you started here. Yeah and break down mm-hmm. how you went from one node mm-hmm. to nine nodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, this was actually the first clip that I graded um, from the video. And so like John said, we've got kind of a lot going on here. I'm gonna go ahead and click all of these off and show you where we started. And so this is where we started, I think, the reason I broke it up into nine nodes is just to keep everything separate so I can apply this to different clips and only tweak parts of what mm-hmm. I've graded. And so we started with just this primary um, correction. The main thing going on here is just brightening up the image. We brought up our gain. Um, we're kind of looking at the overall contrast. And so turn that on and off for me. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's important to see the waveform here. Mm-hmm. Everybody looking at the screen, just try and keep your eyes on that waveform when we mm-hmm. go before and after. Mm-hmm. Do it for me one more time. Just bringing up a little bit of lift gamma gain, just a tiny bit, mm-hmm. and you increase saturation here too. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so that just like helps to kind of expand mm-hmm. your waveform a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gives you a little bit of separation yeah. of color and whatnot. Yeah, so. and so from there, I went ahead and applied John's LUT. And so we have the LUT only at about 70%, um, just kind of giving us some more contrast and shape and getting us closer to the ballpark. Um, I I will say from the creator of the LUT, a a primary function of my LUTs and the reason I wanted them built the way that I did is because I wanted them to be flexible for a lot of people in a lot of scenarios and I didn't do it perfectly there will be more LUTs coming Mm -hmm. by the way but Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is kind of shaping like you said like you Mm -hmm. kind of a lot of work in the HSL tab was done Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of like general kind of like color shape Um, so yeah when you turn that on and off Mm -hmm. all like what you'll see is some HSL happening Mm -hmm in kind of your brown tones on the wall yeah. and your greens, a little bit of skin work. Mm-hmm. So from, yeah, from the maker of the LUT, that's that's mm-hmm. kind of what's going on here and yeah. turning it down a little bit mm-hmm. is helpful to just, yeah, provide shape mm-hmm. without completing or overdoing right. it right out of the gate. Right, and so then from there, this is, I actually went to this first node and this is kind of a trick that I learned. So I noticed that his skin right here is looking a little hot and as well as the suit, we're kind of getting pretty high up here on the waveform. And so basically I've got this node, all that's going on is um, within our qualifier, we've qualified just the brightest parts of the image. And then over here, we have brought the highlight down by Mm -hmm. negative 65. And so basically this is just kind of taking some of the sting um, off his skin right here and the brightest parts of our image. So if you hit shift H, um, this shows you what exactly I'm selecting. Mm-hmm. And so I think I, I wanted to bring this down until I started to just grab the parts of his skin um, that felt a little too bright for me. And you can see we're grabbing also kind of the specular yeah. highlights off here in the corner. But basically that is letting us keep our exposure up and make the image feel bright, but not lose information. And we did this on node one, so that from the get-go, we are reducing our information um, before we were cranking our gain. Right, Um, So trying to keeping everything contained. Yeah, if we would have done this afterwards or later in the node structure, that's gonna, you're gonna be dealing with information loss. Right, so technically you did the gain first. You lifted the gain first. Yep. yep because you you did that first as in like you showed up in your color tab and did that but then you noticed this is bad so instead of dialing back your gain on the node following you went one before brought Mm -hmm. it down Mm -hmm. so now that gain 
that's being brought up there is a more compressed. Yep. Okay. Yep. So yeah, then from here, what happens? Yep. Okay. So next we have this node called curves. Basically, this is just I'll show you it on and off. This is kind of massaging the colors ever so slightly, just using mm -hmm. HSL. And so in here, we've mm -hmm. got just a little dot right. um, bringing our skin um, just a little more towards green. Mm -hmm. And we have some saturation changes. Yeah. And so basically, I noticed the suit was looking a little blue. And we don't have a ton of true blues in the video. We're not dealing with a sky or anything that's really that blue. And so I went ahead and desaturated our blues, pushed our greens a little bit to make the, the trees or the, the leaves pop a little bit. Yeah, that... And then same thing with skin, um, a little bit of pop in the skin. So this mm -hmm. is subtle, but it's just making all the difference in making our image feel more consistent mm. um, yeah, overall. Yeah, that's good. So then, yeah, let's just keep going. Mm -hmm. So then here, we've got this one called Blacks, and basically from our lift gamma gain earlier, we're looking down on the waveform, we're looking a little high, and I was wanting the image to feel more contrasty. So basically in the Blacks here, we go to our first, I don't know, Some our log, log wheels. wheels. Um, we're just basically just tweaking our shadows, and I also played with the low range to affect um, just the darkest parts. I was trying not to touch. So here's a little nugget hidden inside of this much longer video. Mm -hmm. um, I need to make a dedicated video about this, but the reason that log, the log tab is so powerful inside of DaVinci, even on Rec. 709 footage, is because you are able to define your range. Mm -hmm. So on the standard color wheels, mm -hmm the waveform is kind of overlapping when you're talking about your lift gamma and your gain. There's a lot of overlap happening there. So when you adjust your lift, mm -hmm. you'll see a significant change in your gamma and possibly even in your gain. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're in the log wheels, you can actually define your range. So as you see Blaze moving this here, you're watching the waveform change and you can literally see how much of the waveform is moving with it. So he defined his waveform to be 0.192 or 194 here. And what that's doing is over on the waveform, mm -hmm. it's actually defining that at the level of mm -hmm. 1.94 here. Mm -hmm. I think um, it typically starts at 0.333. Yes. So if we go back to 0.333. It's pushing um, more down than you want. Yeah. So we actually, when we move it to 0.194, we're keeping our lower mids more in place. Yep. And we are just trying to hit the shadow portions of our image. Yeah. So anyway, there's a little nugget mm -hmm. hidden in there. Mm -hmm. What's so, the yeah. white? So next, so we did blacks, whites. This isn't something I usually do, but I noticed after I had brought down my highlights to bring back his skin, I felt like the white in the suit was a little dull. And so rather than trying to qualify his skin, which was constantly changing, I actually qualified our whites. And so if we hit Shift H here, we see that with our qualifier, we just grabbed the whites, we turned our blur radius to about 10. No skin. Yeah, and so we're, we, I could have done this by, um, you know, back here, only doling out the skin, mm -hmm. but that's a harder thing to qualify, and it, when I was playing it, this just held up a lot better. And so basically, we just have um, a little bump on our log wheels highlight mm -hmm. and some bump in our game. And this is just making this light. Yep. And again, always when we're turning off before and after, look at that waveform, you can see what happens here. Yep. So he's just putting a yep. little lift there. And, and we're, we're doing this after our curves, which took out our blue. Mm -hmm. So we're, this made it easier to qualify because it's not, it's not picking up a lot of blue yep. in the suit. Cool. And so next is going to be our Glow MD. And this actually one, this one actually kind of does a lot. Yeah. And so the yeah. first thing we're doing is just 
adjusting our mid-tone detail. So yeah. this is just taking out um, a little bit of the digital yeah. look for me. Yeah. Makes it feel a little softer, but not losing sharpness. Fuji is a little bit prone to over sharpening. Mm -hmm. It definitely comes out of the camera. For as filmic as their yeah. video footage is, yeah. it is very yeah. sharp. And I think especially I, I shot Sigma. on zero sharpness. I think yeah. I could have shot on minus. Yeah, shot yeah. with less sharpness, but and I just want to. Not only that, but. Not only does Fuji come out a little sharp, but you're also using Sigma glass, mm -hmm. which is sharp, tack sharp. sharp. So, so turning down the midtone detail. Mm -hmm. Then we're actually going to open up our open effects, and I have the glow loaded up in here. So if we toggle mm -hmm. that on and off, that is what's doing a lot of the work. Yes. Um, in this tab, and so yeah. basically, we brought I loaded the standard glow preset and brought our th shine threshold down okay um, that's really the only thing tweaked here and then we came down here to our composite type and changed it to soft light so I think mm -hmm. normal or it's on add yeah, it's maybe on it's... normal or add I can't ever remember which one it does default but it's something like that the yeah. soft light has a different effect soft light just changes the blending mode to affect more of our more of our image than just the bright parts. Yes. So we would have kept our threshold um, higher. We're affecting less of the image. Yeah. And we're trying to affect more of the image. Mm -hmm. And then I think the opacity is typically closer to half. And I just brought this down right. to not lose, to not crunch it too much. Yeah. And for me, this is just, yeah, once so, again, like we said before, helping it feel a little less. Difficult. And this is interesting because it's it's adding more contrast, but it's actually softening yeah. up the feel of the image. Like yeah. the feeling of the image is a little bit softer when you yeah. apply this uh, node here yeah. with the glow. Yeah, and so, this is just a trick. I feel like I throw this on all my footage and I will play with just these sliders regardless yeah. of, I just like the way that the Fuji image affected by this kind of plug in. Yeah. And especially if you don't want to commit to a pro mist, glow mist, cine bloom filter, if you don't want to commit to that on your camera day of filter, then this is a great way to, to kind of provide yourself a similar effect in post without committing on the front. So then you've got two vignettes. Yep. So let's so see these. Vignette one is I'll show you guys where that's affecting. Um, we basically just dropped a power yep. window on here and softened it. Mm -hmm. This is giving us some general um, shape yeah. and um, just making these sides a little less bright yeah. as he you know moves around. We're trying to keep him the focus. Yeah. So basically, yeah. the way I do that is just down here on the. Um, two things going on. One is on our curves. So I just make a point just right on this line and just ever so slightly. Just pretty much a mid-level. Tug, it, coming tug down. it down. Yeah, you can okay. see what we're, we're affecting. So we're just affecting the darker parts of our image yep. and bringing it down. And okay. then one thing I've noticed, sometimes when you vignette this way, it does increase the saturation of reds mm. on the edges. So a little trick that I do in the hue versus sat is I actually desaturate my reds mm. on me on Smart. the edge. Smart. So if skin is ever out there it feels a, it feels just darker, not more. Well yeah, because when red. you're adding that when you're when you're dropping that level and adding more contrast to your mm -hmm. image, mm -hmm. red is usually mm -hmm. the color that ends up mm -hmm. popping. Yeah. Which is actually yeah, we all know that because we've all shot on Canon at least once in our mm -hmm. lives. The mm -hmm. Canon skin tones mm -hmm super red usually yeah. or historically yeah and they're known for that contrasty look uh so yeah anyway red red will come through usually if you add yeah. more contrast and black point so mm -hmm. yeah that's smart just subtle out. just subtle it's something i'm used to doing i don't think i did it on this image because i saw that reds were bothering me along the edges that's just something that yeah i'm used to so okay uh last Final. node is a 
second vignette and basically we're doing the reverse and so we're using our same circle window but we made it super long i just stretched it out to the max oh, okay. and then softened it a little bit so if we see what we're affecting we're basically affecting the middle of our image and i just made it off to the side because light very rarely is going to be perfectly Linear. perpendicular so if we know the sun or we have a light set up it's going to be Angular. Going to be angled yeah. and we basically did the opposite over here so we went to our brighter side of our curves and we just bumped that up ever so slightly and so um, basically what that's giving us is it's making him just stand out ever so subtle without affecting the rest of our image right which if we were to over simplify mm -hmm. your whole workflow here if we yeah. were to if we were to extremely oversimplify it yeah what you've done is some contrast mm -hmm. some saturation mm -hmm. some hsl adjustment yeah and then most importantly i think mm -hmm. you've separated your subject mm -hmm. from the scene or the background but not in an unnatural way yeah so you've the brightest part of the image the part i'm most interested in looking at is elijah lead singer as he moves around a room even when there's a bright metal bicycle things mm -hmm. like this if we were to oversimplify the concept of what you've done here, that's really it. Mm -hmm. Some contrast, some saturation, mm -hmm. some HSL where yeah. you, you know, we got the skin right in, in shooting, like on mm -hmm. the day of, mm -hmm. we did most of the lighting pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, this is like, to me, a classic case of like how shooting well and exposing well, yeah. white balancing well, yeah. it's going to save you so much. Sure. Like turn the whole grade off. Like, like that, just that looks, it looks like it's gonna make so much sense for you to arrive at this end. Yeah. That to me, yeah, that looks very natural. It doesn't look like an artificial yeah. grade. So yeah. anyway, that's that's mm -hmm. pretty much it on the grade. Yeah, any, any last, last thing, I mean, if you look at my waveform, we're getting pretty close to zero. I think some people can say I'm a little too low. I think I, when I was exporting this and viewing it on Vimeo and YouTube, where it was gonna live on my mm -hmm. phone, I think originally I probably had my lift a little higher and I just felt the more I was viewing it, this is where I maybe broke the technical rules a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I was just seeing my, it felt like my export just, when I would export it, it looks a little brighter than it does here in DaVinci. Mm -hmm. And so keeping this real, real close to zero was more of a touch on the, the finishing side of viewing it yeah. on the platforms where it's gonna live and it. I didn't want it to feel too washed out. Yeah. And so this, this is the frustrating reality of color grading and being yeah. a colorist and being a videographer is that your final product is going to be viewed on a hundred different screens in a hundred different places mm -hmm. with different internet capacities and different yeah viewing platforms yeah. between instagram or vimeo or youtube etc yeah and you're going to be delivering this to a band yeah. who has to post it who has to yeah. share it so yeah. they may not know how to do that properly yeah. so in the end you want to make an image that you're proud of, that you're happy with, mm -hmm. that is as close as you can possibly get, mm -hmm. and then just live with the reality of the fact mm -hmm. that it's never mm -hmm. going to be consistent. And yeah. and like Hollywood movies yeah. have to deal with you watching yeah. their movies yeah. on your phone. No one's gonna watch this in my DaVinci Resolve viewer, so no. I'm willing to break um, maybe this a little bit to yeah. get the image where I want it yep. for the most amount of people. Yep. on YouTube and a phone. So. Yep. so there we go. Okay, that's it for the color grade. The rest of the grade is mm -hmm. almost the exact yeah. same. We copied and pasted um, pretty much all the same nodes with the exception of I didn't qualify the whites on every image. Mm -hmm. So that was starting to kind of break up in some different clips, but the node structure um, is super similar no matter what yeah. clip you, you look yeah you look at so we we won't be able to break down every clip but we want to show at least the base grade of what was going on here mm -hmm. and that's it so let's go ahead and jump into the whip transition okay. of 
Trey's wink. I think that was, mm-hmm. to me, that was my favorite whip transition. Uh, I think it was one that we did well in camera. Mm-hmm. Um, you executed it perfectly. And we already spoke to that a little bit on the production video. Uh, so we're not going to talk about how to execute whip transitions. Yep. There are other videos about that. Yep. We kind of talked about how we did that. Um, but we're basically just tripod you know, mm-hmm. tripod head is just spinning really fast, yep. and then you're spinning really fast into your next shot. Yep. And using an nicer tripod is good because mm-hmm. then you can like really land on a dime. Mm-hmm. Like you can stop mm-hmm. perfectly right where you need to. Yep. So just show us how you manage that when you brought these clips in. Yeah, we'll go ahead and just play it real quick. Perfect. So this is really simple. If we zoom in um, on just the, the ending of these clips, you will see that we were on Nate. And I basically cut it exactly in the middle when we were um, when we were whipping. And so this is the beginning of Trey's clip, and this was the ending of the one on Nate. And if you and can't so, tell, this was, this was not... Um, yeah, these were two separate shots. Yeah, two yeah. separate shots. You moved the tripod in between these shots, but it looks like yeah. you kept you were spatially aware mm-hmm. so that you kept kind of your angle the same yep. and, and like looking downward and everything. Yep. So yeah. So that's, we're just cutting and we're not really doing any blurring in post. This is just from the the camera and then we come right here in a tray shot and yep. a wink right on the right yeah. on the beat. Yeah. So there's really not much to show here. We kind of knew yeah. there wouldn't be much to show, but we wanted to demonstrate mm-hmm. kind of what was going on. Really quick, we can't go to an example, we don't have time, but what would you have done here mm-hmm. if you didn't nail the whip transition? Yeah. yeah, if I wouldn't have nailed it in camera, basically the tray winking right on the beat is the most important part to me. So I would have lined up his wink on the beat and then let's say if this would have been a few frames earlier and it's like, oh man, the whip, you know, is not going to line up because we're cutting from here to when we whip, you can basically just cut off a portion of this and change your speed mm-hmm. to sort of s- speed up that, speed up or slow down that initial um, transition in. So yep. on this clip, I probably would have lined up his wink and then on Nate's clip, I probably would have chopped it and sped it up to, you know, 200 or 300%. Right. To get the whip to happen, to then let our wink lay Hit the beat. beat on the beat. Because so, that's, that's the most important part. So that's, yeah, we just wanted to cover that, that there was at least one yeah. that happened in the video mm-hmm. that you did have to do this. Yeah. We won't be able to cover it, but yeah. But, it's just good to know that if you don't perfectly nail that whip transition, yeah, um, you can just using some retime mm-hmm. controlling, yeah, um, some speed ramp, mm-hmm. you can get pretty close with mm-hmm. a good fake. Because mm-hmm. um, it's going to so. be hard when you shoot it, um, unless you're shooting it and then directly after going to pull this into an editor and see. It's really hard to see in the moment if you nailed it right on the beat or if you were a few frames off. Yeah. So. There we go, that's that's the whip transition. Show us uh, your favorite zoom in post, like mm-hmm. like your digital zoom, because mm-hmm. not everything not everything was dolly, not everything mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. Uh, zooming on yeah. set. So some of it yeah. you zoomed afterwards. Yeah, so if you see these orange clips right here, all these orange adjustment clips are where a digital zoom is happening. And so let's just go to this one right here of Elijah. And essentially, this is just giving us... Essentially, that is what's happening here. Um, Mm -hmm. I do this on an adjustment clip. We're basically going from about 1.1, or no, 1 to... Let's see where we end up. 1.94. It's really or subtle. Or click, click the uh, arrow. 
click the arrow next to the keyframe here. Well, it's okay. Like the technique. Well, but that explains the technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the technique that I use is basically I wanted all of these to feel at a similar speed to one another, and these clips are different lengths. So if I would have come in here on the clip level and zoomed in and keyframed my original clip, I'm gonna mm -hmm. have to do that on all of these, and they might mm -hmm. be faster or slower. So basically what I did is I made a master adjustment clip um, and stretched it out really long. So if we go right to where the keyframe, I made an adjustment clip that was this big, and I set it to 1.67. Yeah, a big, and we big start zoom. At, we start at one, and basically I knew that I was never gonna use a zoom that long, but I knew that I could shorten it to whatever length and mm -hmm. it's actually going to keep the speed. It's going to keep your keyframe down here. And so yes. basically on any of these clips, I just held the option and dragged it. And, and that's going to keep your, your digital zoom, your digital push mm -hmm. at the same consistent speed every time. Mm -hmm. My question is, mm -hmm. did you match the zoom to the speed of the dolly push? Because right here is a great example where we have Elijah sitting on the couch and then mm -hmm. and then Elijah singing, you mm -hmm. know. And this is a real dolly push. Yeah. This shot here is mm -hmm. an actual dolly push. Mm -hmm. The shot prior, is this good. is a fake. This is mm -hmm. a digital zoom. Mm -hmm. The speed matches. Mm -hmm. I think I just kept that in mind. I wasn't I didn't you weren't well, I didn't for one to one them, but I knew I wanted them to feel similar. Okay. So okay. when I was setting that one point six seven number, I was just playing around with with numbers that gave me a similar feel. Right. Um, and stylistically, you did decide to do the digital push because when you had these overhead tripod shots, they just felt a little stagnant, mm -hmm. mixed between the the dolly zooms, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mixed okay. Between the dolly zooms. And That's then, a simple creative decision. There was nothing mm -hmm. major going on. Yeah. There. And then if I ever wanted the zooms to be a little more intense, rather than changing the keyframe, I actually just double layered them. So I wanted these to feel like a little bit of a quicker zoom. So I actually duplicated it mm -hmm. on top, and this makes them go twice, twice as fast. And so. Okay. Um, rather and than the, changing my speed and spending all the time doing that I was just able to hold option click and drag up mm -hmm. and create duplicates and, set. and that's just part of that creative decision there would be that um, the beat picks up yeah you're kind of zooming in yeah. on the instruments playing yeah. and yeah. okay cool yeah. those are those are the digital zooms mm -hmm. the next thing was just the TV mask mm -hmm. but we are going to forewarn you that this TV mask yeah thing that Blaze did here. Yeah. Um, this is not for this video. Like yeah. like this kind of this kind of work is is for a dedicated video that other people have made and other people are much more qualified to make. Yeah. Uh, that Blaze used to learn how to do this. Um, there are two ways of going about it mm -hmm. that Blaze tried. Mm -hmm. There was a fusion method mm -hmm. uh, in the fusion tab for mm -hmm. like graphic effects. Mm -hmm. And then there was a color tab option mm -hmm. because you still have access to some of the effects mm -hmm. that you have in fusion. So yeah. you ended up using the color one. We are not mm -hmm. going to address the fusion right. one. I used both. I did the beginning of the video actually with the fusion tab and it was a lot harder than I thought and once I learned that I could do it in the color page I used the color page for the rest of the video so there's actually two different methods and two different masks yeah and they look really similar yeah so if you can catch the difference you know good for you good but for you. we're gonna do the color one mm -hmm. <laughs> so just try to take us through in the most simple way that we can because we don't have time for the full dedicated thing uh, let's see let's see how you went about the mask. Yeah, let me. That's fine. We can, we can cut here. Okay. Okay, so here we are in our color page on our TV clip. And so this clip that we had selected is just the TV with a blank screen. So this is how we shot it. 
we had the TV sitting there and we did a dolly push in on it. And so I graded this similar to the other clips before I did any type of um, masking. This mm -hmm. is just the grade on our yep. original clip, doing what we did before, looking at our waveform. And the day of, we shot this knowing that you might mask. Yep. So we shot this with the screen turned off. Yep. We knew that you might mask it. Yep. So again, a big aspect of probably making your life mm -hmm. a little easier was having done the work yeah. in pre-production yep. and then on the production day mm -hmm. so that afterwards it was, it was a lot more simple. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Yeah, and so then I set up, I set up a new node and I right clicked and added what is called an alpha output. So mm -hmm. that is this blue output yeah. that's added and we actually drew a line from this node to our alpha output yeah. and so yeah we toggle this on that's where you now see this this middle part disappear that is because we have this separate output set up and so this is basically done within the power window section if I shift yeah. H hit um, yeah. basically you're gonna see this mask and so yeah. we used the I don't know what this free is called, draw yeah the free draw tool and basically what I did is I started at the beginning of our clip and I zoomed in and let's see you doodled your way around basically it. I did a rough I knew that I wasn't wanting this to look 100% realistic I wanted to get it close enough so I basically drew all these points and you know, made it feel a little softer so it doesn't look like a hard edge. Mm -hmm. And that is basically... So that's the mask. That's the mask. So wow. I don't so, know how many points are there, 20? Sure. Uh, so you start with a quick doodle around your TV screen yep. on the very beginning of your clip. Yep. And then... And then we're going to go over here to the tracker. And basically, I essentially kept the tracker settings as is you just click and play the play button click, and it tracked it through play and it tracked it and i think there was a couple inconsistencies here and there but basically it was just keeping it kept, did a good job of keeping these points on the edge of the frame of, of my of my frame and so Sweet. it's not perfect it doesn't look you know 100 percent correct but when you're you zoomed out and you're watching it for five seconds i felt like it was yeah. it was close enough for me Here's another little nugget that I'm going to throw in at this point is that it is really important when you're doing color work and even with VFX work, I think it's really important to watch your footage within the context of the video mm -hmm. because like Blaze just said, like yeah. you could very well get obsessive about this yeah. and you could spend hours yeah. on zooming in you know, masking the tracker, tracking it frame by frame, mm -hmm. and you could spend a lot of time doing yeah. this. Yeah. And your time would would probably show yeah. if someone were to download your video, zoom into three hundred percent, and watch every corner of your TV frame. You know, they would maybe notice, um, but it's important to watch your film in context, yeah. especially as you're color grading, as you're doing VFX sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Because like Blaze just said, this is a five second clip yeah. in the context of a whole video. So mm -hmm. you just got done watching one before this, mm -hmm. you just got done watching another, mm -hmm. or you're about to watch another mm -hmm. clip, and you're less focused on the mask happening here, yeah. far less focused on that than you are on, than like what is in the mask. Yeah. So you're watching Elijah, the lead singer. Mm -hmm. You're watching him. You're not watching the edge of the mask. So anyway, yeah. so you, you yeah. mask it, so you all track it. All we're doing here in the color tab is we are cutting this out. This footage doesn't exist yet. We are just cutting out yeah. this clip. This and is what you came out with. Yeah, this okay. is what I came out with. Okay, so now that we have this mask, how do you get into how do you get footage into the TV? Yeah, so we are going to go back to our edit page and basically you see this stack that we have right here. And so basically this top layer is the clip that we just affected in the color tab. And so if we just turn that on, you're going to see our TV and the black. Hole. No, nothing. 
and that is for anything we want to put under it. So down here on layer one is our video clip. Um, this was coming right from the section before. We you just cut. Yep, shrunk it down, make it proportionally fit the TV. Right, you change that later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then basically the other two things here are just stylistic. Um, this is some TV uh, grain artifacting that we just blended with the screen. Okay. And then there is this subtle, you can't really see it in this clip, but this is the same color visual that you see elsewhere in the video. This okay. was something that I designed for the band and you kind of see this on the TV a lot. But And in Fusion, you just add a little warp. Yep, to Fusion, it. we see the, the warp. Um, some of this like TV banding, that's mm -hmm. just some, some fusion stuff. But that is very subtle in this in this clip. Right. I believe it's set to lighten and to... 13%. Yeah, no. 13%. Much. So that's yeah. where we reach the final um, product here. But yeah. really all we're, all we're really having going on is... A TV masked TV. Mm -hmm. with a clip inside of it. With the clip inside and... So it's really pretty simple, yeah. actually, to yeah. do this. Like, yeah. That, yeah, if you avoid the fusion tab, right. mostly, right. it's pretty simple. That alpha yeah. output yeah. on the color tab. Yeah. We so, tweaked we tweaked our grade quite a bit here. If we solo the bottom clip, yeah. this is really dark. I had to make it a lot darker because the TV static brought it back. Brought up. it up, but yeah. super simple. Other than that, yeah. just stacking them up. Yeah, which that TV static is not a separate asset. That is just nope. That is just a clip of the TV with the static on. So we zoomed in. Yep. You know, three. Perfect. You know, this was. But you just probably our opening clip. I just. But you gathered the effect. Punched, punched in, and then we used screen and the overlay set to about sixty percent. Perfect. Okay, so after this. The last thing was uh, the titles. The last mm -hmm. thing we wrote down. Mm -hmm. So let's just see one of the title sequences. Give us the very basic overview. Yep. Because uh, this was actually pretty simple how you ended up with, mm -hmm. with this. So. Yeah. So let's decompose this group. And so we have two simple, just standard Da Vinci text titles. Yeah. Um, one is just of the little title I gave them and then their name. You guys uh -huh. can see the fonts and, and what we did there but basically we did that for all the band members and then we selected them all and clicked new compound clip and that okay. is where we get this group and at this point if you click Z or yeah okay there you go it looks very digital it, it does kind of have a vintage style because there's a sh drop shadow on yeah. it but it looks digital yeah. it looks very digital very but then digital. when you apply the effect all of a sudden it looks like Full house, yeah, '90s sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. so you have it in a composed compound clip. Compound clip. Yep. What happens? Yeah. Here? So then we're gonna take this into the fusion page. So we're gonna come over here and say maybe maybe before we do this, let's okay. play the clip here okay. just to see what what we're gonna show, which is that the clip has a little bit of movement. Uh, that's one of. <laughs> That's kind of one of your key parts yeah. here, is that the titles kind of wobble yep. and bounce around. We can zoom um, in and show that. Yeah, so that's perfect. Okay, so now let's yeah. go ahead and look at the, the fusion, yeah. what you've we're, done here. We're achieving all that in fusion. So if we open in the fusion page, let's zoom out just a tad, or we can keep it at 100. Um, We've got some nodes down here. Basically, these are just doing the shake and the kind of texture. Yeah. So our first one is a subtle film grain. Uh -huh. um, this is adding just a little bit of texture to the otherwise plain yeah. text. And we have grain on the whole, Project. so it kind of helps it kind of come come together and feel more organic. Okay. Next one is camera shake. Um, you guys can look at the settings over here, but this is what is giving it that really subtle um, movement mm -hmm. and move on to our glow glow is just adding again taking away the a little bit of pop a little bit of pop we used glow on our in our color page on our other images so right. the hope here was just to match that and this was achieved by just playing around with 
these settings here on the right. Mm -hmm. And then last is analog damage. And okay. the only thing I tweaked here is actually our detail loss. So if we see okay. before and after, it's kind of blurring our edges, mm -hmm. taking off again some of that, some of the digital, um, yeah, some of the digital look. Yeah, um, the sharpness. The sharpness. Yeah, cool. And so all of that added together is getting you um, what you see here in the in the final right final image. Yeah, cool. Well, I think uh, that's it that we had written down for notes. Mm -hmm. Any final word, post-production mm -hmm. notes? I mean, man, there, there was so much more we could have done at this episode, mm -hmm. breaking down the organization structure, breaking down yeah. um, why using DaVinci as opposed to Premiere, right. you know, uh, so much we could cover. Right. There will be a Q&A episode at some point, mm -hmm. so leave your mm -hmm. comments below. Uh, about things you're curious about, questions yeah. you might have, but yeah. final notes? Yeah, final notes, we'll just talk about our two top layers up here. So this is just how I applied the grain. And so if we decompose this group, this is just a grain overlay that I found in some pack somewhere, I'm not sure, but we yeah. just have the composite mode set to overlay. Okay. Uh, this is just the subtle film grain that we, Perfect. we have going on. And, Basically, I just duplicated it a whole bunch and mm -hmm. then threw it in a compound clip, do a new compound clip, okay. and then changed our overlay mode to overlay. So we can toggle on and off our grain. And you don't have to deal with a hundred little a grains. A hundred little clip. We can just okay. turn that on and off. And then lastly, it's just a letterbox of mine. And so if we yeah. zoom in here to the corner, there is some very subtle, just okay stylistic yeah adds a little little flair to the image mm -hmm. but that's just done i think typically the one that i use um, has a white background with black edges so you multiply and we just change our blend mode to multiply to get rid of the white okay cool and you custom created this mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that would be called a dirty letter box mm -hmm. sometimes they're mm -hmm. called that um mm -hmm. So if you're looking for a similar asset online, um, eventually Blaze mm -hmm. might have it for sale mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and if you see this, this is actually a 16 by nine letterbox that I created. And if you actually look, Stretch. I messed with my transform okay. to basically make uh, this fit. So you don't always need to go out and buy a 235, 235 one and a 16 by nine one. Just and change your zoom. All your other, you can play with your, your zooms independently and okay. um, make it sweet. Make it work. Cool. So that is it for this video. This was post-production final episode. Um, we did a pre-production, a production, and now post. So if you haven't seen the other two, go watch them. But if you have questions about this, we'd love to answer them in a future episode. Someday, we're not sure when, we will make a post-production or a, a general production Q&A. If you want to know anything about the whole process, how to get this kind of work, uh, if we can help in any other way we want to. So leave comments below, leave questions on any of the videos. Um, we want to help you out. So anyway, thank you, Blaze, for inviting us into the back of the project here and showing us some of your secrets. This was a ton of fun for me because I didn't know how some of this came together because mm -hmm. I got to help a lot with pre-production and yeah. production and I wasn't sitting over your shoulder for post-production. So this mm -hmm. was really cool. Mm -hmm. None of this is familiar territory for me. I don't do VFX. I don't do compositing. I don't do more than three nodes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, get, yeah. I get easily intimidated by these things. So this was really helpful even for me so yeah and the hope would be to like encourage you guys with you don't have to know that much to achieve what you saw here i think yeah. some of the things that i used are simple tricks that i use in a lot of projects that i made work for this one and you don't you don't need to know how to work fusion 100 percent. i think mm -hmm. i know i feel like i know the basics if there's knowing nothing and then knowing the basics yeah. i know the basics yes that's yeah that's the encouragement here is that you don't have to be a top level pro expert in any of this stuff to make an incredible result like Blaze got here. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll talk to you in the next one.